everybody, it's Felisa, and today is going to be another story entry into murder mystery and mayhem. <laughs> anyway, today I'm a little under the weather, so I have my tea with a little bit of cayenne in it. Um, I'll probably have to take some periodic sips. I'll move away from the mic so that I don't trigger anybody out there with my deep swallows. Anyway, I struggled with selecting this story because... I don't really like to, you know, talk about children who are involved in any type of trauma. You know, they're innocent and it's just sometimes disturbing to me to talk about things where um, children are impacted. But this is, you know, part of history, of course, and maybe because I have been aware of this story for a very, very long time. And most people who think about, I'm going to call them episodes of school violence. People who think about episodes of school violence normally think about like Columbine or Sandy Hook or something like that. And maybe because they're more recent in our lifetime. Um, but there was a very um, deadly episode of school violence back in the 1920s that I'm going to tell you about. So come with me as I tell you about the story of the Bath Township School Massacre. This story involves Andrew Kehoe, who was born in 1872 in Michigan. He was one of 13 children and I couldn't find like anything about his formative years. Like I looked for like elementary school. Like I just wanted to know what kind of kid he was. Was he like a bad kid? Did he, was he obedient? Did he, like what was his hobbies? What did he do? Although when I started looking at this, I'm like, he was one of 13. You know, if I had had 13 kids, honestly, I would probably keep up with one or two of them and whatever those two did, the rest of them did too. Cause I just don't have the time. Anyway, he was one of 13 children, didn't really say anything about his formative years, just said that he went to one of the local high schools. He wound up going to Michigan State, which he needed to have pretty good grades to get into, so I'm assuming that he was a pretty decent student. Went to Michigan State, studied electrical engineering. I was about to say he studied electric engineering. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Anyway, he studied electrical engineering and became an electrician. He moved to St. Louis. He did well from what I could see. You know, there was nothing eventful until one day he had some type of mishap, fell and hit his head. And the head injury was extensive enough that he was in a coma and he was in a coma for a little while. Once he reemerged from the coma, he was like, forget this, I'm about to go home. So he went back home to his father's farm. By this time, his mother was dead and his father had remarried to a much younger woman as you do. Anyway, nothing was really said about, you know, if Andrew came back with an attitude like, what you do to my mama? Or why is my mama dead? I mean, you know, you just kind of accept those things, I assume. And maybe his mother was ill. Who knows? And does also didn't say whether or not he got along with his stepmother at all. I mean, she was much younger, but it doesn't say how young. You know, I would love to have had that information. Like, how? Anyway, I'm going down a rabbit hole. Anyway, so all seemed to be okay until one day in September of 1911, stepmama was cooking or whatever it is that you do at the stove, and it blew up. It was an oil stove, and I was quite intrigued by that because I'd never heard of an oil stove. Like, I had to try and figure out, like, I wanted to visualize, where do you put the oil? Like, how do you light it? Is there a wick? How, how would you do that? So I Googled it and I looked at some pictures of oil stoves and I could see how it would blow up. I could see how I would blow that up because that didn't look safe at all. It don't look safe. It, it just can't, can't be safe. Obviously, it wasn't because it blew up. Anyway, Stepmother was seriously injured and, and was on fire. And so Andrew, being the dutiful stepson that he was, he threw water on her. Because that's what you do when there's an oil fire. Anyway, it wasn't helpful. And she wound up pretty much emoting. And she died the next day from her injuries. Now the townsfolk, I just wanted to say townsfolk. <laughs> anyway, the townsfolk thought that Andrew did this on purpose. It was never proven that he did. And I don't think that he was like even brought up on formal charges or even investigated, you know, it just seemed like a horrible, horrible accident. So now stepmama is dead. 
I don't know what the poor daddy did, but Andrew seemed to get over it because he got married the next year. His wife's name was Nellie. Well, actually, her name was Ellen, and they called her Nellie. Just, I just don't understand these nicknames. Anyway, they called her Nellie, and they got married the next year, so that would have been 1912. And Andrew was 40 at that time, which made me wonder, like, was that late to get married? I, I always thought that they got married earlier. I don't know. Maybe Andrew was doing his thing, and... He didn't feel like getting married until he was 40. Who knows? Anyway, it took him about seven years to actually save and buy a farm, and they moved right outside of Bath. So around this time, Andrew was about 47, probably going on 48. Now, the neighbors, for their part, said that there were two sides to Andrew. One was the very accommodating, very lovely individual who came over and helped them with chores and volunteered and probably did wiring and all kinds of electrical things, whatever electricians do at the turn of the century. I don't know. Whatever electricians do, that's what Andrew did. And so he was quite dependable and all those kinds of things and did a lot of favors for them. They also said that he could have quite the violent streak. And there were two situations that were specifically mentioned. The first one was a neighbor's dog came over to his property and shot and killed it. Now, I tried to give Andrew the benefit of the doubt. I tried to give him a pass for maybe, you know, like maybe was the dog rabid? The dog come over like all aggressive? Was the dog like chasing the livestock or, you know, maybe chasing his wife? Did Andrew have reason to believe that maybe the dog was a threat? And so, yeah, you know, I could see how they he would put it down, right? But then there was a story about Andrew beating one of his horses to death because it wouldn't do what he said. With a hammer. That was disturbing. Psychotic much? Anyway. And I don't know why you don't report stuff like that, but anyway. That happened and, you know, it kind of, I guess, set up cause for alarm, but... Not all that much. By 1924, Andrew had run and was elected to the school board. He served three years as a school uh, um, trustee, excuse me, and then one year as a treasurer. He was known for being frugal, and what better position does a frugal person ever dream of having is that other than that of a trustee and a treasurer? because they're cheap. I suspect that Andrew had like a method to his madness though. While he probably did want to do something with the school board and was very interested in being the treasurer, because of his frugal nature, i.e. his cheapness, he really was a thorn in everybody's side. So people said that he was very contentious and he would argue about every little thing. He fought them tooth and nail about any upgrades, any expenditures, and he for doggone sure was not about to let them raise taxes. He was not having it. Nope. Nope. Nobody. Nope. Nope. And so he fought them tooth and nail on everything. Unfortunately for him, he lost. And when he did, he got very, very, very upset. So much so until some of the neighbors were very concerned about his behavior because, you know, he was really, really kind of having these episodes, so to speak. It didn't really stop him from moving forward because even though he was contentious, contentious? One of those. He still was elected to fill a vacant clerk's position in 1925, which is baffling to me because if you are arguing with this person and if this person is blocking you at every single turn, why on earth would you give them another elected position? Temporary or not, like it just did not make sense. Like I just keep, like people of Bath, what were you thinking? Anyway, so he temporarily held this position, but the very next year he was defeated in the actual election. And most people think that that actually set him off. I don't think that that was the catalyst in and of itself. I think that maybe that was kind of the, the tipping point. You know, he felt rejected. He felt, you know, like they trying to take my money, <sighs> that kind of thing. Um, and so he didn't feel heard and he probably did not feel respected. 
It wasn't until 1926 that people started to really think that there was something off with Andrew. So around that time, of course, now remember they put these tax increases into play and he was paying more than what he felt was his um, fair share and more than what he felt the property was worth at that time. Um, so he was really having a hard time with the financial crush of it all. Anyway. It was also around this time when he was defeated for the further term and his neighbor started to notice that his farm was falling into disrepair. Now, I kind of had to think about that because my first question was, how? How did you notice? Like, what, what, what did you notice? Because if I think about a farm in my, you know, little house on the prairie, you know, kind of mindset, I'm thinking... Okay, the farms aren't close together. It's not as if, you know, like where I live now or most neighborhoods, where if I look across the street, I can see that my neighbor is not mowed or lawn. Sincerely, if I stood on my porch and I tried to look three blocks over, let's pretend like there were no other houses in front of me and the nearest house was three blocks over. I can't see that. But apparently this neighbor felt like the farm was going into disrepair. Furthermore, he had some concerns that Andrew might be trying to take himself to go see Jesus because he was giving his stuff away. And, you know, that's always been kind of a telltale sign psychologically that um, there's some impending harm that you want to do to yourself when you're trying to give things away. And again, I'm like, you ain't telling nobody. You just said on that. And he didn't say that until after he had been interviewed, after everything went down. So I find that pretty suspicious and weird and just dumb. Like if you sat on that information, like why? Why would you do that? Anyway, so... He said that he noticed that the farm was slipping into disrepair. Now, nobody knows quite when Andrew hatched his plot. No one really knows when his thoughts started to turn dark. It should be noted, too, that around that time, his wife Nellie had become sick. And so she was hospitalized in a sanatorium because she had tuberculosis, or they suspected that she had tuberculosis, which was also called consumption back then. And there was nothing that could be done if you contracted TB. There's still no cure for it, but I mean, at least there are some, you know, kind of treatments that can help you not die. But back then it was almost a given that if you developed it, you you know, they could prolong your life with some plaster casts and topical stuff and maybe an iron lung and, you know, all those kinds of things, which required long bouts of hospitalization, but there was really, you couldn't cure it. And you certainly couldn't, like, you know, give somebody a quality of life that was going to be meaningful. Anyway, so Nellie was sick. They increased the taxes on his property. He ran, he ran for re-election and nobody wanted him. He's feeling abandoned. And on top of all that, his wife's aunt sent a notice of foreclosure. Now, what I couldn't figure out is why she held the deed in the first place. So either when they moved seven years prior... She put up the money for the farm and they were supposed to pay her back. You know, a lot of times families gifted, you know, land or what have you. And, you know, you had a, um, a a deed to the land and you got that deed after you paid that off. But it was not through the banks. It was through your family. So maybe that was the case. And so she paid the money up front and then Andrew was supposed to be paying her back. And he didn't when he was all, this is so unfair with the taxes and whatnot. Um, so he wasn't paying her and she decided that she was going to foreclose. So on top of everything else, his property is being foreclosed on. Now, what was interesting was that when he got the notice of foreclosure, um, he was talking to the clerk and someone overheard him say that, um, if he could not have the house, that nobody could have the house. That's not creepy. That's not, that's, that's not weird as you do anyway. So like I was saying, nobody really knows when he started to think these dark thoughts, but he did. And so over the, the summer of like 1926 and into 1927, he was stockpiling dynamite and pyrotol and he was scoping out the lay of the land. Now during the summer, he had access to the school building, free access and nobody tried to stop him. Now, I thought about this, too. It may not necessarily have been that nobody tried to stop him. It was summer. 
there were probably nobody there was probably nobody in the school the kids weren't in school I don't even think that the concept of summer school existed back then it just wasn't heard of you know the kids were probably at home slopping stuff and milking things and tilling and mowing and plowing or whatever it is that farm children do and down at the creek when they have free time and weren't anywhere near the school the teachers wouldn't have been there because it's summer so who would have really been in that building except for maybe a caretaker and the occasional secretary or something or or cleaning staff or something like that um so Andrew being there and being a former member of the board and then also being an electrician probably didn't arouse much suspicion because they either thought that maybe he was there on official business, even though he wasn't a trustee anymore, but maybe he was there on official business, school board related, or he was there to rewire something. No matter the case, he had free reign of the school throughout the summer and into the fall. Well, when the fall came, he was still able to, you know, kind of diabolically put some things in place and, you know, do some wiring and all that kind of stuff. Then came the spring of 1927. Andrew purchased a rifle during this time. And it should be noted that the excessive amount of pyrotol, which is an explosive, the excessive amounts of dynamite, um, and the rifle never aroused suspicion simply because those were all very common things that farmers bought back at that time. The pyrotol and the dynamite were quite common for farmers to excavate their land. Remember, this was way before um, the development of big machinery and, you know, the ability for farmers to do large portions of land at one time. You know, people were digging things by hand. They were using um, beasts of burden, you know, large horses or cows or whatever to drive plows and, you know, to do all of those kinds of things. And it was very, very, very physical. And some things they just could not remove, tree stumps, rocks, St things like that and so they would use the explosives to blow that stuff off and out excuse me uh, uh, and then remove it so all these things he, he bought did not arouse suspicion it would not like be like today anyway so may rolls around he's you know he's ready for the big event right so on the morning of may 18th he gets up and gets dressed all of a sudden his house and his farm or his farm his barn explode and when they exploded some of the debris landed far enough on the the neighbor's farm his immediate neighbor so they're like what the heck excuse me so everybody in the town goes running over to the Keyhole Farm. They're like trying to break out windows, get in, blah, blah, blah. Andrew Keyhole, for his part, sees the people coming, looks at them, and is like, um, y'all better get to the school and takes off in the opposite direction. So the people are like, what's wrong with this fool? Like, seriously. There was one witness after the fact who said that he passed Andrew on his way to Andrew's farm and Andrew waved and smiled a smile that was so chilling that he felt like he was staring at Satan himself. Now that could have just been a flair for the dramatic. I have no idea, but it sounded good, didn't it? It sounded really, really good. Anyway, so Andrew gets to the school. School started at 8.30. Um, Andrew wanted to make sure that all of the children, as many of the children and as many of the staff members were actually in the, um, in the school building before he launched his second part of his, um, his plan. So at 8.45, he detonated the fire bombs that he, uh, strung up in the school and it collapsed the whole North Wing of the school. Once the, the volunteers that was at his farm heard this explosion, I really want to know how close they were. But anyway, so they heard this explosion. They like, what was that? So they all take off. They leave the farm that's burning. 
take off running back to the school. And the volunteers said that when they got there, it resembled a, a war zone. 38 people died in the initial explosion, and most of them were children. Around that time, though, and this is where I get my timing a little bit off, and I tried to read a couple of stories like to try and figure out the timeline. I think it, ha it would have happened like within minutes of each other because Andrew set off his bombs at his house early enough to cause an, a, a diversion. I believe that that's what that was. Like he wanted that first explosion like he wanted the farm and everything to go up people run over there so they would be away from the school as they're fully focused on the farm he's going to the school now that to me suggests that the school can't be that far away because number one people at the scene of the house fire heard the explosion and number two he got to it didn't take him all that long to get to the school so anyway, Andrew drives up to the school about a half an hour after the first explosion. So all of the people are now back at the, at the school, like trying to dig through. They're digging through, um, getting the, the debris off of people, off of the children. Um, some witnesses said that uh, some of the children were stacked up underneath the roof, and they were stacked up like five and six deep. And so they're like lifting bodies out and laying them in an open area. So Andrew drives up about a half an hour after the first explosion outside of the building, of course, was the superintendent and, you know, some other trustees and um, important figures. I can't remember their names, but they're all outside, like, you know, probably doing one of these numbers. So Andrew drives up, sees the superintendent, waves him over to the car. He comes over to the car. They get to... You know, like, bah, 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 bah. so they're going back and forth. Eventually, they result to fisticuffs. I just wanted to say fisticuffs. Anyway, so they get to fighting. Now, witnesses say two different things. One person say says that they saw Andrew pull out a long gun and shoot the superintendent. Someone else said that, no, he didn't see a gun and they were just fighting. I tend to believe the gun angle because remember, Andrew did purchase a long rifle and he purchased rounds of ammunition. I probably didn't mention the ammunition, but it just kind of stands to reason that if he bought a gun, he bought ammunition. So let's just go with that. Anyway, I tend to believe the first witness who said that he no, he had a gun um, simply because he bought it. And I can't imagine that his crazy self did not decide that he wanted to pack that, that he just forgot it. So while they were grappling over the gun, um, Andrew detonated his car. Now, what he'd also done, obviously, was in addition to booby trapping the school, booby trapping his house, he booby trapped his car. And when he detonated it, he immediately killed himself, the superintendent, three other men, and an eight year old boy who happened to be outside at the time. One of the craziest things, though, is that there was one guy who actually survived the initial blast because he was at the school. He had wandered outside at the same time that Andrew detonated his vehicle and was killed by the shrapnel. I cannot imagine this final destination mess that just happened to this man. Like, like how does that even happen? That is crazy to me. Anyway, that's exactly what happened. He survived that whole explosion and a building collapsing only to stagger outside and to be hit by a shrapnel from this crazy man's car. Anyway, it took them a minute to like really dig through and sift through all of the ashes, all of the, the aftermath, the debris. I can't imagine the trauma that the moms and the parents actually had as they were like trying to lift babies out and bring them out into the forefront. It just kind of put me in my in my mind's eye. I remember um, watching some of the footage of when they were kind of like going hand by um, hand by hand, um, like space by say space by hand um, with the Oklahoma City bombing. And how um, they brought that, that little baby out. Her name was Bailey. I'll never forget it. And the firemen, like, they took a picture of it. He was carrying her. And, you know, she she just looked like she was sleeping. But obviously she did not make it. That's, that picture still breaks my heart every time I see it. Because it was just so incredibly unnecessary what happened to them and what happened to her and what happened to these children at Bath. Anyway, so the aftermath was obvious, obviously 
Andrew was dead. He'd killed, you know, as many people as he could during this explosion. One of the things that they did notice after um, all was said was done, all was said and done um, and they started to go through some of the wreckage and you know try and piece all of this insanity together they discovered a couple of things number one Andrew had wired the whole building he he wired the whole building only the north wing detonated though everything else failed to detonate so his plan was truly diabolical more diabolical than it actually turned out to be because he was intending on collapsing that whole school and probably killing half the town if not more um and and it just did not happen that way um he after after he died you know people were like hey where's nelly they thought maybe she was still hospitalized. Then they thought, well, maybe she had run away. Maybe, you know, she was in on it. Like, where is she? Well, they finally went back to the farm and they were able to sift through all of the, um, the you know, the charred remains of the building and whatnot. And they did find her body and she had been killed um, prior to Andrew blowing up the barn they or the house they also went into the barn and discovered that he had wired his horses legs together um so that they could not run and then he he set the barn on fire like what kind of psychotic who does that like i'm not suggesting that we should not like that that's just to go to those lengths it's just insane to me like beyond insane so anyway they did find a sign wired to the fence that said criminals are made not born yeah they never really did figure out like what was the source of andrew's discontent i'm almost surprised given the tendency for folk to claim to be crazy in today's day and age when it comes to standing up and taking accountability for crap that they do um, I'm surprised that nobody actually pointed to his head injury as perhaps a source of his, you know, his, his psychotic state and his ability to go from zero to a hundred in record time. They reported him as having something called an ungovernable temper. Um, and he had a mania for killing things. And if you say something like that to me, like, what you like, you're basically saying that the person is psychotic. So, are they saying that he developed this or, you know, what was the source of this malaise and when did it become noticeable to people or had they always noticed this about him, but they kind of gave him a pass because he was good at other things. That sometimes happens too. you know, people pimp out other people's talent and they just overlook the insanity that they bring to the table because they want something from them, which is not right. I guess we'll never know. I mean, it's, what, 1927, and Andrew is not here anymore to speak for himself. It's not as if he left a note, and if he did, we've never found it. You know, it's just going down in the history books as one of those horrible tragedies and one of those horrible disasters that probably could have been prevented if people had been more outspoken and been more proactive. But then again, like, what do you do? I don't know. I have no idea. But that is the story of the Bath Township School Massacre and Andrew Kehoe. I hope you've enjoyed this story and I will talk to y'all later.